if you look at the original SARS-1 virus, about 60% of patients still have liver dysfunction 12 years after they've actually so-called recovered. And quite a lot of them have got uh, hypertriglyceridemias and other disorders of fat metabolism. So it looks as though COVID-19 in, in some ways is very similar. The original SARS affected, according to the records, exactly 8,098 people in the years 2002-03. And we are at 123 million people worldwide today, uh, of which 101 million are so-called recovered. So if you look at some of those statistics, percentages, and scale that up for what we have now, we are looking at tens of millions of people around the world will have symptoms and effects for COVID-19 for many, many years. So it's a major healthcare burden increase that's been imposed on us by this disease. Using NMR and mass spectrometry, we can measure hundreds or even thousands of different molecules that are representative of the activities of different pathways which are affected when you have a disease. In order to develop a new diagnostic, we apply those tools and then we apply appropriate statistics in order to pick out which of all the chemicals are changing are particularly diagnostic for this condition. And it turns out for COVID-19 there's a whole range of stuff that is very significantly altered and those things that are altered reflect the different systemic effects of the disease. Let's say we measure 10,000 different metabolites which we could easily do using our technology. Of those, maybe 30 or 40 of them are really highly diagnostic and several of those are diagnostic for different subclasses of the disease. So when we're trying to create a new diagnostic, we want the smallest number of metabolites to give us the most efficient diagnostic sensitivity. And the tests that we've got with NMR and mass spec look as though they're up to 99% sensitive for detection of COVID-19 versus, for instance, other respiratory diseases, uh, which could be confused with COVID-19 influenza being a, a classic type of example. And then the question is, can the degree of change, the degree of phenocontroversial, be proportional to this degree of severity? And different people have got different sub-side effects, if you like, of the disease, different amount of liver involvement, different amount of diabetic involvement. And so we can use the information to try and classify or sub-phenotype the different COVID patients. And from that knowledge, think of how we best uh, inform doctors to improve the therapy for that patient. That is where personalization comes in. And the same technologies that we use, the same models that we use for assessing severity, or the different subphenotypes, we can also apply for samples that are taken after the acute phase to measure the amount of recovery that those patients actually have. We're interested in understanding why people are, be, become severely ill and others don't. A lot of the Western Australian patients were, were actually not particularly badly affected. Most of them were not hospitalised. And what we've looked at is six months after the acute phase of the disease, um, when people have recovered, um, we found 57% of people have between one and nine symptoms. And those correspond with a whole series of biochemical changes in, in the body. And as a group, a cohort, um, they're, st they're still abnormal at six months, um, which means they have not functionally recovered. So we're trying to un unpick the cytokine overdrive by measuring cytokines as well as metabolites and looking for all the statistical correlations between the, the, the cytokines and the metabolites to understand what we call the immunopathological drivers of the disease. The virus is pretty much largely gone from the body after about 60 days of infection. So anything that's after 60 days is actually your own body reacting against itself. And of course in the case of long COVID or post COVID syndrome, that is entirely driven by your own body attacking itself. Things that you may have only had mildly in the early phase of these can actually get worse as well. And then there's all sorts of stuff that is not symptomatic. So the liver dysfunction, which is very common, may not resolve at all in some patients. And about 25% of patients lose their sense of smell. But it can be worse than that. There's something called parosmia, which is when tastes are fundamentally changed. So you can find that your favorite sort of chicken sandwich suddenly tastes of marine diesel. And those things are not about changes in your nose. They're changes in your brain, right? Your brain chemistry has been rewired in some way. And one of the things that we're trying to do with, certainly with the Brooker mass spec 
machines is understand those changes in brain, brain chemistry from the pathways that are relevant uh, to those processes. And as we plough through the thousands of samples that we have now, we'll be able to make more and more refined models for predicting um, post-COVID syndrome and potentially what sub-variety of post-COVID syndrome that somebody might get. And if you know that early, that means you can start thinking about a suitable medical strategy for managing those patients and mitigating the effects of the disease.